The next, uh, the next speaker that I want to introduce to you is uh, Dean Carlan. And Dean Carlan is someone I met through Nick Christoph when we worked on After Sky. Nick Christoph is very uh, interested in metrics and evaluation uh, because he's getting a lot of those questions all the time. And because he wants to know where to invest his time and the time um, that people in his, on his projects are, are uh, focusing on. And um, the, when, when we did After Sky, Nick basically said, you have to go to Yale and you have to find a guy named Dean Carlin because he literally wrote the book about what works. And this book is more than good intentions and it's really the book uh, about what works in evaluation. And we're not talking about evaluation of cancer, we're talking about large scale evaluation of any intervention worldwide. Um, he's not only a professor at Yale University, Dean Carlin also uh, runs and is the founder of uh, Innovations for Poverty Action, which is uh, a type of an incubator for such projects. As one example, one very famous example is the Warm the World around the warming and testing on worms that has proven to be one of the most effective interventions, giving kids the pills uh, to fight uh, intestinal worms. And this is a, a project now, a huge project that came out of this uh, lab. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Dean Carlin to you. Thank you. Okay. I don't, I don't need that. Oh, I'm on here. Okay. Ah, okay. That's better. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with every, everyone. Um, and thank you very much, Asi, for inviting me. And uh, I look forward to further conversations uh, the rest of the day. So the, the title of the slide is a little bit different. I'm going to get to prediction games at the end as an example of a byproduct of some of the, one of the projects that we, that we have done and an idea that we would like to push forward. But I want to focus most of this talk about impact measurement. And the, the punchline being you don't always get what you want. Right? We, we need more than, we, sometimes we have a theory, we have an idea, we have something that seems on target. Um, and, but it doesn't always work out. And, and I say this as someone who's come up with ideas that don't always work. And the, the key theme, theme to what I'm going to be presenting to you is a series of projects of which we don't always get what we want. Sometimes we have, but sometimes we have not. And the key is kind of careful measurement so that we can learn. So the, you know, one of the things that Asi said in introducing me was um, flattering, but at the same time completely wrong. Um, I, I have far more questions than, than answers. The idea that I know what works is, is, is actually the flip. I, I am, what I, what I like to do is go about figuring out what, what is working, what is not. But you know, when someone comes to me and says, what should we do? We have a few things that have risen to the top that do have strong evidence. But most of the things that are out there, we actually just don't know. And so what we're really putting forward is a process for helping to figure that out. So let me start off with a basic question. Which would you buy? Bag of oranges with something in the order of eight, nine oranges, hard to tell what's underneath, or a dollar for the one on the left. Most of us would take the one on the right. That's a pretty straightforward question um, and trade-off. So here's a second one. Which would you buy? $5,000 to pay for deworming of school children, which will pay for some pills to help the children get rid of intestinal worms, or $5,000 for free school uniforms? Suppose that your goal is to improve school attendance. That is what you're trying to do. Which one of these will get you more school attendance? Both of them have a good solid theory of change. If you're sick with intestinal worms, you're not healthy, you don't go to school. If you don't have a school uniform and your school requires school uniforms and you don't have the money to buy one, then getting you a free school uniform gets you to school. Which one gets you more bang for your buck? I, yeah, I, this is not something that we can answer in the abstract without data. And the whole heart here is, the heart of this is that when we as donors or policymakers, or organizations have to make these tough choices, this is not something that you can just, you know, kind of do the Excel spreadsheets and kind of dream up an answer. And it's not something that's intuitive and obvious. You need data and you need evidence in order to do that. Um, and so this is the heart of what Innovations for Poverty Action, the nonprofit that Asi mentioned, does. And we discover and promote effective solutions to global poverty problems. And there's two words there are the most important in terms of explaining the two parts to what we do. The discover has to do with, in some cases, innovating, very much like the panel described before. Sometimes the work we do is integrated in with the innovators, the, the people who are designing the program to help think through what it should be. Other times we're just helping to measure the impact of something that other people are doing, and we have nothing to do with the idea itself. 
But I put that both in the discovery and that's part of the research aspect, the, the measurement. And then the second is the promotion, taking the ideas that have strong evidence behind them, that they're cost effective, not just that they work, but that they work better than some of the other leading alternatives. So that for every dollar you put in, you get the most out that you can possibly get from what we know. And then we work to help scale those things up. We work by lobbying government, policymakers, donors, whoever the right, whatever the right audience is for each lesson. And that's the heart of what IPA is doing. So we start off, I, as I'm, a, I'm an economist, that's my day job as a professor of economics, so I have to say the following things, otherwise I lose my, my PhD. I have to tell you that markets work. <laughs> this is like rule number one. Um, but what allows me, if that were the only thing I had to do, it wouldn't be much of a job, it would be very boring. So the fun part of the job, intellectually and challenging part, is the second part, except when they do not. Okay, and this is really the whole space for intervention. And I, when I teach, I usually talk extensively about market failures because it's, the, it's what inspires us to act as donors is the idea that something happened that the market didn't work and solve a problem. So what is it that we're trying to solve? What is it, what is, is it, is it a behavioral failure the way, the way people are making decisions that they're, they're not, they're not, they don't have the right information or they have the right information but are not acting on it in a way that they themselves in a moment of deep reflection would say they want to. So a classic example is I'm tempted by chocolate cake, I want to eat less chocolate cake, the chocolate cake is staring in front of me and I eat it. Right? In a moment of deep reflection I would say I would eat, much prefer to eat fewer pieces of chocolate cake. So, so uh, that's a behavioral failure about the way we deal with temptation. And, and, and so that's a good example of except when they do not. Now um, what we want to do when we want to know does something work, it's really important that we actually pose the question correctly. And this is the key differentiator between what we are doing at IPA and, and others in our, in, that, that are doing this type of work um, and, and a lot of other work that is measuring, quote, impact, is answering this question. How have lives changed compared to how they would have changed? Now, the first part of that question is fairly straightforward. You can look at some people and see how have they changed. Are they, are they going to school more? If it's, if it's a financial literacy game, to put it in the context of this gathering, are they, they played this game and now are they saving more? Did they open a bank account? Did they do some activity in, in, in term that, that, is, that is trying to be um, changed? But the second part is really the tough part here, is how would the, their behavior have changed? And the problem here is, the, is one that's called either self-selection selection bias or what's generally referred to in economics as omitted variable bias, which is to say, suppose we were doing something um, to help an entrepreneur run a better business, a game to do that. And they do better over time. How do we know that the game changed that behavior rather than just good economic conditions caused their business to do better? So we have to have some comparison in order to be able to say that they're doing better compared to what they would have done. And, and if that comparison is simply someone who did not participate in this training game, how do we know whether the training game caused them to work better, to, to have a better business, or whether it was the fact that the people who choose to participate in training programs are looking for ways to improve their business. And if we divided the world into people who are trying to improve their business and people who are not, odds are the people who are trying to improve their business are going to do better over time compared to the ones who are not. Right? And that's a selection bias. And that's what tells us that we cannot just go and roll out some sort of intervention or training program in the context of this, a game that is trying to teach business skills and say, well, how, is the, how have the businesses done of those who participated compared to some people who did not choose to play this game? So we can't do that, and that's the whole motivation. We need to mimic or construct this counterfactual. That second part is the difference between an evaluation, an impact evaluation, which really helps get at causality. Did this game cause a change to happen? Or whether it was something else that is simply correlated with participation in the game. And this is the whole motivation for doing randomized trials. This is the reason why we cannot take prescription drugs in America without drugs having gone through a randomized trial. And what we're doing at IPA and others doing this type of work are basically taking those same standards of measurement and, and attribution of causality of a program and saying, let's apply this in the social science space. Let's apply this to behavior modification. Let's apply this to public policies. Let's apply this to businesses. Or in the case of a rollout of a game that's trying to teach some teach people how to change behavior, let's reply this to that. Now, I'm gonna give you four examples of what this looks like and some results, some results that kind of go each way. 
um, except one of them is one that's, a, I think, a good example of a program that has huge success and does not have an evaluation with it, and I'll pose to you why I think that's a problem. <clears throat> so the first is an M Health study in Uganda. I want to be clear about one thing. I realize this is the title of this festival is Games for Change. None of these are things that I would literally constitute a game. There's a couple of these that are kind of close, you might agree, in terms of the way they're, they're, they're done. But nothing in here, I think, constitutes a, quote, game. But they're all in that mode of behavior modification. So the first was an intervention we rolled out. I mean, others rolled it out. We worked to evaluate it um, in Uganda. And it was an evaluation that worked through cell phones, I mean, a program that worked through cell phones, where you, actually, you had access to a text message service where you could fire away a question and, and an answer comes back. And it was intended to teach people about sexual health or other things in the public health space, the hours for a local clinic. But then there were also a lot of questions about condom use, um, HIV, things of this nature. And it was trying to promote um, 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 healthier sexual behaviors. Um, and the first thing we want to know is we have to set, to set up a randomized trial is not always easy in this type of way because we don't actually have control over whether someone is going to use something. And in this case, everybody was, it was available to everyone. It was just a, t a number you texted, 6001, and you text off a message. And we couldn't make it so that some people could and could not get that. What we did is we set up basically marketing brigades, is what they were called. And there were people that went into, we had about 80 villages, and 40 of them were randomly chosen out of the 80 to get a big marketing push, where there was a marketing brigade went in and promoted this service and went up and talked to people and said, hey, there's this new service, MTN and Google are doing this thing, and here's how this works, and, and let me show you an example. And, and then people started using it. And as we see from this graph, there was actual considerable usage. So that's a first stage, first important stage. People are using it. But that's, you can't stop there. You gotta see behavior change if you wanna know what your actual impact is. So here's what we found. Um, one of the, this is just a glimpse of the, of the, of the results. So when we look at the number of partners you had in the past six months, we see that actually went way up for men, and for females stayed about the same. And when we looked at likelihood of being unfaithful, we see that went up for both men and women. This was not the goal of the program. <laughs> now, the, in a sense, there's a little bit of this that you can, you can tell this in a good way if you want, which is it was promoting condom use, and there was evidence of heterogeneity in the way people responded to access to this information. First of all, people did engage with it in a kind of camaraderie kind of way. It was, people would get together as friends, and we did this when we were testing it. Um, some of the results we got, when, before it got launched, for instance, we, we were trying to break, the, break it a little, and so we were firing off all sorts of weird questions. Can I turn a condom inside out and use it again? Um, and, and back would come an answer that said no. <laughs> Um, we tried another one and said, I'm a 15-year-old girl, and I'm attracted to other girls. What should I do? This one, unfortunately, the answer came back, and they did fix this. Um, it came back and said, don't worry. You, too, will meet a man and get married. Um, so they fixed that. That was, like I said, we were in the alpha phase, and we were just trying to, we were trying to break the system and just trying to explore and see what happened when you asked questions that were outside the normal. So that, that um, but the point is it's open to whatever people want to do with it um, in terms of the questions they asked. And so people did... Um, use it in a, in a friendly kind of um, social way. But the idea, the thing that we think of happened, and a lot of the qualitative work matched the quantitative data that we collected, suggested that there was an, um, a um, kind of a separation in which there were some people who did start saying we will want to use condoms more and things of this nature, but that there were others that did not. And so what ended up happening is, is you know, imagine your spouse says, I want to use a condom. Well, your answer wasn't just yes. Your answer was, well, then I'm going to go have sex with someone else. And so that's hence the increase in the unfaithfulness. We also saw a decrease in the likelihood that any given person had sex. So there was, there was a clearly changes in behavior that involved different people reacting differently to this. OK. Second, financial literacy, very popular. This is actually more into my space. I'm most, most of my work is in financial inclusion and understanding more about how access to credit and savings and insurance can change lives. Financial literacy is a very popular um, approach to try to deal, with, um, to deal with helping people make better decisions. There are more programs that have been evaluated and found no impact than ones that have. In most part, we think there's a clear correlation between knowing more about financial literacy and, and good financial decisions, but that does not mean that taking someone who is low on financial literacy and getting them more of it actually changes behavior. Getting that link from knowledge to behavior is a problem. So here's an example of a study from Mexico. This is set up as a randomized trial with a treatment control. 
found all these nice changes on knowledge from this financial literacy program, but a year later found absolutely no changes in behavior. So, you know, knowledge is not sufficient. So here's my analogy. This is my one slide that actually has a game on it that might be near and dear to you. A lot of the financial literacy games do something which I know no one in this audience would possibly argue should we should do, and that is to say, let's play plants and zombies in order to teach farmers how to farm better. Right? So even if Plants and Zombies teaches you something about different, different plants and, and the gestation period or something like this, does not mean that it's going to be a tool to change farmer behavior. Right? And we know that. I mean, I realize this is a silly example. But the point is there's a lot of financial literacy games which I think actually are actually not doing something not so different than that. I don't say games, but financial literacy programs. And then one can imagine a gamification of such a program. And if you're not thinking proactively about how it's going to actually change behavior rather than just increase knowledge, then it's probably missing out on, on its opportunity to have an impact. So this is my example of one that is desperately in need of a proper evaluation. Bank for America had this nice program that had huge numbers of, in terms of people taking up called Keep the Change. You sign up for this. And what happens, it's still, it's still around, you can still sign up for this. And what happens is you use a debit card, and it rounds off. So if, you're, if you buy something for $12.42, then 58 cents, it rounds up to the next dollar, goes into your savings account. And they showed usage data on this that showed huge, huge numbers of people signing up and, and amounts in the savings accounts going up as well. Right? So this is akin, and the reason I use this example in this context is because I could easily imagine a situation where a game goes viral and is getting used by a lot of people. And the point is use does not mean impact. So why am I skeptical and keep the change? Well, it could go two ways. One is maybe I'm saving without even thinking. That's actually maybe a good thing, and maybe that leads me to save more because at the end of the month, when I'm making tough decisions, I'm shorter on money because I was doing this saving without thinking. And then I actually spend a little bit less on some meal or do something a little bit less, and I actually have managed to accumulate more savings without thinking. That, that might be a good thing if the goal is to save more. On the other hand, there's the been there, done that problem. Now, if, I che if I've checked the box in my head saying, been there, saving, been there, done that, I don't put the money aside. So if this actually is, to me, savings, think about how much money you're actually saving in this, pretty small amounts. Right? It's just a rounding error on your transactions. If it's one transaction a day, a day a, a one, and I'm sorry, one transaction a day for the month, that means you're saving $15 a month. This is not going to help you for retirement. This is not going to help you for your kids' education. This is not going to help you save up for a down payment on a home. This is dribbles. Right? And so, but if that is giving you this sentiment of you are making a good, solid financial decision that is on the track towards long-term savings, you are very misguided and you are going to find yourself undersaved when the, when the time comes for greater needs. And so this is a good example of where a good, clear, randomized trial could go a long way in helping us understand, is this actually leading to more savings or not? OK, my fourth example, and this is going to segue to the um, prediction games that I mentioned. <clears throat> so think about the, the chocolate cake example that I gave you in the very beginning. So I, this is not an example out of nowhere. Um, I, I like chocolate cakes, potentially if they're kind of crunchy with some pralines maybe or nuts. Um, and I've learned that if I go to a nice dinner that, um, and, I, I, and I, my absolute sweet spot is to order a nice meal, have some wine, and not have dessert. Right? Even though I like the dessert, but I know in the long run that I'll gain weight and I don't want to, right? What I've learned is that just never happens. <laughs> and if I don't want to have dessert, I got to skip the wine. Okay, if I skip the wine, when dessert comes, I say no. But if I've had wine, when dessert menu comes, I go ahead and do the wine. So then here's the solution I came up with a bit ago. And this doesn't work when I eat dinner when it's just my wife and me. But it works very well if I'm out to dinner with a friend, someone I trust, um, but who also has a little edge to them. And the dinner menu will come, the wine menu will come, and I'll say, and then we're deciding, should we order wine or not? And I'll say, okay, yeah, I'd like some, let's do some wine. But we'll order wine. But if I order dessert, I owe you $100 or $1,000 or something. The point is painful, right? 
So now, the dessert menu comes, and even if I have half a bottle of wine in me, or a third, or however many people at dinner, I'm not going to spend $110 on wine. I'm, I mean, sorry, $110 on, on dessert. That's nuts, right? I don't care how much wine I've had. I have some sense of, like, that's just inappropriate. So, so this works, and I do this, and then I don't eat dessert. I have my wine, I have my nice piece of fish, and I'm a happy camper. So this is a commitment contract. What I've done here is figured out I want to change my behavior, and, but by doing that, I need the price of my vice to be higher. Now, I can't just go around and ask, I can't, well, I mean, the other option is when I walk into that restaurant, saying to them, uh, don't bring me the dessert menu. Commit to me now, you won't do that. Or, or just bring me a menu with higher prices, please. <laughs> Same thing, like, I can't go to 7-Eleven and ask them to raise the price of peanut M&Ms. Right? I'd love it. I'd be a much happier person if peanut M&Ms cost a lot more money. Um, but I can't do that. So I need ways of committing my future self or raising the price of my future vice. Right? So that when I'm faced with that decision, when it's, when it's a hot decision and it's right there in front of me, I know that the temptation is not as great. So I started this website called Stick, stick.com, which gives people this tool for doing this. So you go on and you, you select a goal like losing weight and stop, to stop smoking and exercise are the most common. But we have lots of creative things people have posted, things like, I will not date any more losers, was one of my favorites. Um, and um, lots of, lots of open-ended contracts that people, can, very creative, put up. You set what your stakes are. That's optional. A lot of people use social recognition for this, so their social reputation. They say, actually, I'm just going to name people who will get informed if I succeed or fail. But a lot of people put money at stake, and we give people the option of choosing an anti-charity. It's a charity they hate. So we have a lot of politically polarizing charities that are on both sides of the abortion issue, environmental, gun control. So take the left and the right. You know, we're not, we're not trying to take a stand here, right? So we give people the choice so they can, of whichever side of the spectrum they're on, and then they can choose the other. And then if they fail, their money goes there. Um, um, it, the, and then you choose a referee. You can choose a referee as in, um, you know, somebody else who has the power to adjudicate whether you succeed or fail. You can use a Wi-Fi scale, for instance, on weight to do the same. Um, and so we tested something like this in the Philippines. It was the same thing. It just wasn't using the electronic version of it with smoking. We went up to a bunch of people who were smoking and said, do you want to stop? Yes, great. And then they entered into a study. And half of them were given the opportunity to write a contract that said, I will take the money that I was using for cigarettes, and instead I will put it into a bank account. And then, at the end of six months, you will test my urine, and if I have residue from, from nicotine, or codeine, is, there's a little thing called Nick Check, you pee on it, then I get my money back. If I fail, then you take my money and you send it off to a local orphanage. Um, so we did that, and six months later, we see um, the smoking cessation rate go from about 12 to 17 percent. Now this is, you know, that might seem like a small number, but this is actually a huge number when you take into account the fact that only one out of nine signed up for this program, right? So this includes all the people who didn't sign up, too. As a percentage, this is a 30 percentage point increase in the likelihood that someone stopped smoking. And the beautiful part about it is one year later, it still worked, right? So this is one of the, you know, one of the famous quotes about smoking is, uh, you know, from Mark Twain that said, I am you know, smoking, you know, it's difficult to, uh, it's easy to stop smoking. Sorry, I got it wrong. <laughs> it's easy to stop smoking. I've done it a hundred times. Um, right? And what, what we found here is one year later, it was still working, right? This, it was, we still had the same treatment effect. And that's six months after the contract ended. There were no more financial incentives in place. Right? And this is a key thing to think about in the context of Games for Change. It's not just about short run behavior change, it's about long run behavior change. Can you actually create habits? habits that then stick, right? Because it's not realistic that you're still going to be playing, you know, 2048 in a year, right? The, these things are going to come and go. So the question is, can you get people playing? Can it change a habit in the real world? And then that habit continues on. So in this spirit, part of what this is about, and this is where I get to the, the idea that we're trying to expand from, 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 from stick into other, <laughs> other venues, is thinking about prediction games in general as a way of two goals. One is a goal of personal behavior modification. How much mileage do we get out of stick from the money aspect, but also do we, get money, do we get mileage in terms of changing behavior by helping people set clear goals and make predictions about whether they're going to succeed or not, having their peers collaborate in making this prediction so that they can get peer support and camaraderie involved to help them 
succeed in, in doing the things that they predict that they will do. And so there's a, you can imagine using that basic architecture of making personal predictions about your own behavior, your own accomplishments, your own effort, and having a peer network that you report this to to help you succeed in achieving this. So that's the first part of the prediction game that we want to do that's more expansive than, um, than the kind of the focused goal-oriented structure that we have right now. The second part we want to do is a policy um, influence. And here the idea is simple. There's many policy debates out there that ultimately come down to a number. Take, um, there was a big issue about bed nets for a long time. Should we charge or should we not in the public policy sphere, in the public health sphere? And it just took going out, I shouldn't say it so simply, it was not an easy study necessarily to do, but it was done well by researchers um, as part of, part of IPA, it's not part of my research, part of others at, at, at the organization, to test, well, what happens to usage rates if we charge versus do not charge? And let's see what happens to coverage rates and usage rates and future buying rates. And it turned out giving it away for free increased later demand for bed nets because people learned that they were good. So it was like getting a free sample at Whole Foods. And the, and the verdict was quite clear, that giving away for free was a better approach. Now, you know, this was a very hot debate, and I wouldn't say it's completely over, I don't think the entire world has converged, but you've seen major shifts in the way organizations that were actually selling bed nets have shifted into giving them away for free. But some of this could have been, I think, done even faster, and I think there's other situations out there where there's hot debates that come down to a single point. And it would be very interesting to set up a, effectively a prediction market, a prediction game that allowed people who are the stakeholders in a debate to make their prediction as to what the outcome of a test is going to be. And the idea being that there's, it's a little bit like, like tying their hands so that, so that if the outcome comes that's different than they think it's going to be, that they've endorsed the process up front. So it, it makes them squirm a little bit more in terms of explaining why they're going to stay put on their policy rather than just shift a little. Maybe not shift all the way to where the answer was, but at least shift some, at least shift in sort of opening up and saying, okay, maybe we ought to get more evidence on this. So the idea is that this might be a useful way of taking ideological debates and dogma and kind of cutting through that by getting people who are on opposite ends of a, of a debate to, to agree to a certain process and a certain prediction um, and, then, and then let the chips fall where they may. And so that's the second part of this kind of prediction game that we would like to get started. Um, so that is, that is the end. Um, I want to thank everyone and I look forward to talking with anybody afterwards. We're, um, at the end of the day, IPA is a network of researchers to a large part of, of what we do. And so there's a lot of interest from many, many different sectors. Like I said, my focus is on financial inclusion, but mostly. Um, but if there's people who are working in other areas of behavior modification and you'd be interested in, in, in getting engaged with researchers who want to measure impact, um, then even if it's not a fit for what I'm personally doing, I'm very happy to, to connect you with, with someone who I think might be, might be very interested in, in, in doing an impact evaluation of that sort. So thank you very much. Look forward to meeting some of you.